Thumbs up. Over on the top of the next page, leases like to get recorded. Remember, we can record stuff and we talked about that. Tenants should record a lease. That way there's never any question in case you have to go to court. You can literally say, well, your honor, here's the lease signed by so-and-so, acknowledge we had it notarized. I entered it into a recording. So there's no question as to which lease is valid because this is the one that got recorded. In Indiana, any lease longer than three years has to be recorded. Now, don't get confused. I do not mean a one-year lease that gets keep get, getting renewed. I mean a lease from the outset that defines a three-year or greater time period should get recorded, all right? And as a landlord, there is a reason you want it recorded beyond a court issue. If you think back to the mortgage, and we talked about this alienation clause, if you alienate yourself from the property, they could call the loan due. Well, if you sign a lease, and the bank drives by three years in a row and they're like, hey, dude, we've seen somebody else in that property. You have alienated yourself. We're going to call the loan due. And you're like, no, 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 no. I still own the property. I leased it to that company. And they're like, really? Can you prove that? As a matter of fact, I can. I recorded this 10 year lease. So I haven't really alienated myself. I'm still involved, still have an interest, still financially obligated. So the landlord may want it recorded for protection, believe it or not, against his lender. So his lender will not claim that they have alienated themselves. There's another clause on page 334 called the non-disturbance clause. I'm here to tell you I have never seen this clause in a residential mortgage or a residential lease. These are used extensively inside of commercial leases. And what a non-disturbance clause is this. If the commercial landlord gets himself into some financial problems with his lender and the lender may decide to foreclose on the investor that owns the property, the, <clears throat> the tenant will have the right to exercise their non-disturbance clause and tell the bank, hey dude, you're fighting with the landlord? That's cool. Don't involve us. Matter of fact, we will pay our lease directly to the bank and don't kick us out. This happened with a marsh there in Southside Indianapolis where the landlord got into some trouble and Marsh exercised their financial or their non-disturbance clause that said, you want to foreclose upon him, go ahead. We're going to continue to stay here because we've spent millions of dollars in advertising and marketing and community welfare. We don't want to get evicted out of this building because our landlord's doing something stupid. So we will pay our rent directly to the bank and don't disturb us. Everybody get it? Leave me out of the fight. You guys want to fight? Go ahead, Shauna. How, how long can you execute a um, non-disturbance clause? It would be defined in the lease, but oh, okay. typically most of them say you can exercise the non-disturbance clause until the issue gets rectified. Either they foreclose and sell the property or the landlord becomes current and back in good graces. And then the tenant will say, okay, we are removing that and now we'll go back to paying the landlord. 
you can do it indefinitely until whatever's going on over there solves itself. In the case of the marsh, what they did is they exercised it indefinitely until the new investor came in and bought the building and then they created a new lease with the new investor. And I know this because I brokered the deal. All right, I brokered the sale of the building to the new investor and Marsh stayed in as a tenant until their 15 years were up and then they exercised their right to terminate the lease and they actually moved the Marsh somewhere else. And if you guys think back to the Marsh located at Smith Valley in 135, it was attached to at the time Kmart, I think. Now it's a Chevy store and the farm, you guys know what I'm talking about? 31 and Smith Valley. It's that marsh with the big glass dome on it. Okay, it doesn't matter. That marsh is now gone because they built a new building over on 135 and moved that one over there, but it took them three years to do that. All right. I have never seen these in a mortgage for residential or a lease for residential. All right. Now, we've talked about an option before, and an option is the right to do something in the future based upon terms we're going to agree to today. In the leasing world, there are three or four different options that you have. And Shauna, you touched on one of these earlier, is what's called the renewal option. The renewal option. It's the option typically based upon the tenant that gets to renew their lease as long as the tenant is in good standing, which if you think about it, makes sense. If I'm a landlord and I've got a tenant that is in good standing, meaning they're paying on time, they're not behind, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, why would I not want that tenant to renew? They're a good tenant. In our lease at the school, that is how our renewal option states. As long as the tenant is in good standing, it is my discretion to renew the lease. Landlord says, if you're in good standing, go ahead and renew it. We don't care. We'd rather keep you in it than it go dark and we have to release it and spend time and effort. So the renewal option is typically at the tenant's discretion as long as they're in good standing. Now, if they want to exercise the renewal and they're five months behind, and all of this problem, the landlord's going to go, no, you cannot renew that because you are not in good standing. I want to terminate this, get you out, get a new tenant in, all right? <clears throat> we also have this thing called a pure option, which we've discussed before. That's the right to purchase property that we agree upon today. Remember, it was the only unilateral contract we use. It's a purchase option. Sometimes you hear the word pure option. Then there's this other one that landlords may give to a tenant called the right of first refusal. The right of first refusal. This allows the tenant to get first chance at buying the property if the landlord is going to sell it. All right? So, if the landlord says, hey, I've decided I want to sell this building, he may he would go to the tenant and go, look, market value is 1.1 million, do you wanna buy it? And the tenant says, yes, I want to exercise my first right, which gives me the first chance to look at it. Yes, I'll buy the building and now I will own the building I'm in. Or the tenant could say no, I really just want to be a tenant. I don't want to own it. Go ahead. And the landlord says, okay, I'm going to take this building to market, sell it, and you're going to get a new landlord. All right. That's called the right of first refusal. I get to be the first one 
to refuse the offer before you can take it to market. Now, you it's hard to give a first right to a multi-tenant building. I guess you could, but you would give preferential to one of them because you can't give all of them the first right. All right, you could only give one. Are we good? All right, I wanna talk about now some different types of leases. And I have prepared a file, I hope. So there are several different types of leases I wanna talk about. The first one I wanna talk about is this thing called a gross lease. A gross lease is where the tenant pays the landlord money, right here, and then the landlord goes out and pays all of the bills. So in essence, the landlord is receiving a gross amount. Remember yesterday we talked about gross minus expenses equals net. So in this particular case, the landlord is receiving the gross amount of rent. And then the landlord would go out and pay the real estate taxes, may pay the HOA, may pay insurance, all of that. This is typically a residential lease. You talk to someone who is renting a house and they will tell you, hey, we pay 900 bucks a month and the landlord takes care of all the stuff. All right. That is a gross lease. There is a second version of this or a second lease called a net lease. Net leases are typically in the commercial world. And here's the big difference. The tenant will pay the landlord rent. Now listen to what I'm telling you. And then the tenant goes out and pays the landlord's bills. The tenant would pay the real estate taxes on the property. The tenant would pay the insurance and the tenant would pay the maintenance of the building. The golden goose of the net lease is this thing we call triple net, triple net. And the, or sometimes you'll hear it called net, net, net. What that is telling you is there are three things that the tenant is paying for. Those are the common ones I just mentioned. Maintenance on the property is paid for by the tenant. Real estate taxes is paid for by the tenant. And the insurance on the building is paid for by the tenant. That is the net, 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 or triple net lease that tenants would pay and like I said, strictly or typically, those are in the commercial world. Now, my question to you, why would a tenant do this? And here's the best reason that I have ever come up with. And I've thought this through many, many times. This was originally created probably dozens and dozens of years ago. And let me ask you, in a gross lease where the landlord pays all the expenses, what would happen to a landlord's net money if one of their expenses went up? If the expense goes up, net would go down, right? Everybody get what I'm saying? If I earned $100 and I paid 50 of it out, I would net 50 but now I earn 100 and I got to pay 60 out, I'm only netting $40. My expenses went up, therefore my net goes down. All right, now look at this. In the gross lease, if my expense, I'm sorry, in the net lease, the commercial one, if the expense of real estate taxes went up, what happens to the landlord's money? Exactly, nothing. 
because the expense is being paid for by the tenant. Therefore, the rent to me is still $900 a month. The expenses going up have no bearing on the lease money the landlord is receiving on a net lease. Do you follow me on that? Because here's the reason why. Now, landlord in the commercial world can literally go out and borrow money because he knows his monthly income is not going to change so he can borrow money to buy that building because if he's making an 8% return on his tenant and he wants to borrow money at six, he's covered for that big commercial lease because his expenses will not affect his rent that he's collecting. And what you see are these big landlords like Simon of Simon Malls. All of those properties or all of those businesses or all of those tenants in the Simon Mall are paying a triple net lease. So Simon, who is earning an 8% return on the cost of that mall, can literally now sell stock to you guys, which virtually is getting a loan, and guarantee that you're going to get a certain return on that stock because I know that my income as Simon is not going to change because the expenses are now being paid for by the tenant. So literally this lease was kind of created with the commercial lending uh, in mind. All right, so that's the net lease and the gross lease.